Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. Good morning, members. Uh, I can confirm we have a quorum, and I call the meeting now to order. And I declare the meeting open to the public online. Can I welcome members participating by telephone this morning, which is Orlea Flynn. Good morning, Orlea. And can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So, um, we're going straight this morning to our single item agenda, which is part of our COVID-19 disease response, and we're receiving a briefing from the Minister of Health and from the Chief Scientific Advisor. We have a single item agenda today, ahead of our full meeting tomorrow. I refer members to papers at tab two of your pack. Uh, so I can advise members that the Minister and Chief Scientific Advisor are joining us to update the committee on the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we are all very aware of the pressures that they are under, and we are glad to have them here today to uh, go over issues. And I would now like to welcome Mr Robin Swan, Minister of Health, and Professor Ian Young, Chief Scientific Advisor. And if I could invite the Minister to brief the committee now, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and I will keep my, my opening comments short today. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to update you on the latest developments regarding my Department's ongoing response to COVID-19. I think this is my sixth attendance now at your committee since the start of March, and I have done three, three ad hoc committees as well, just keeping members in the Assembly updated. Uh, as you are aware, Chair, deaths involving coronavirus in Northern Ireland have fallen for the fourth week in a row. And last Thursday, we reported no new deaths from COVID-19 for that day. This is what we are working towards, I think. It is what we are all working towards, and we need to play our part as the restrictions left to limit the spread of the disease. Because while the downward trend is, is welcome news for us all, I must emphasise again that COVID-19 remains a real threat, and there is no room for complacency. And you know, always mindful that every death represents a loved one who is sadly missed by their family. And we must never lose sight of this as we enter a new phase in the battle against coronavirus. The executive has announced uh, a number of restrictions that could be lifted in the coming weeks, provided the R number does not increase above one. So it is vital that we continue to act responsibly in the days and months ahead. We must continue to adhere to the guidelines, making sure that we keep a safe distance away from others. And whilst it may seem trivial in light of the overall impact of the virus on our health service and economy, but it's generally one of the most effective tools in fighting this virus for us all to continue to wash our hands regularly. People will never have washed their hands as much in the last few months, and even after that pandemic, this pandemic has passed, and it will pass. I hope this new culture of increased hand hygiene um, will continue. You will be aware of the progress made across a number of areas since I last addressed you, not least the extensive uh, operation of contact tracing. And as per your request, Chair, I will not go into detail um, this progress and my opening address, but will instead focus on the work ongoing across the system to rebuild our services. The impact of COVID-19 has been felt right across our health and social care services, with significant additional backlogs building up in areas such as screening and elective care. So whilst we continue to battle the virus, I'm of, I've also been clear with my officials that I want to see the resumption of services as quickly as possible. So all trusts have now submitted uh, a draft phase one rebuild plan, but I was clear that wherever they could, I want the services immediately resumed. Because now is not the time to be getting caught up in process. I'm acutely aware that COVID is not the only illness sadly claiming lives of people across Northern Ireland. So it is critically important to recognise that this will not be a return to business as usual. COVID-19 will continue to impose significant constraints on the capacity to deliver services due to the need <coughs> to adhere to social distancing and the need to use appropriate PPE. Rebuilding of services will involve increasing service capacity as quickly as possible across all programmes of care within the prevailing COVID-19 conditions. However, the huge challenge we face as we move into the rebuilding phase is how to maintain the capacity to provide care for patients with COVID-19, while simultaneously increasing all our urgent clinical services, important routine diagnostics and planned surgery, while at the same time we need to retain the ability to quickly repurpose and surge our capacity if required in the event of a second wave of COVID. So my department is currently developing a strategic framework for rebuilding health and social care services, and I intend to publish that very shortly. 
the aim will be to maximise service activity within the context of managing the ongoing COVID-19 situation, which will prioritise services whilst embedding innovation and transformation, incorporating the, the Encompass programme, developing contingencies and planning for your future. Uh, Chair, that's just a very brief opening statement, and I hope it's helpful. And we'll, we'll both take questions from, from yourselves. Okay, um, thank you, Robin. Uh, I suppose my first question will be in relation to you mentioned yesterday, uh, or in, as part of your statement, you mentioned the Rapid Learning Initiative, um, which I welcome, based on based on the fact that I have said on many occasions that we do not have the luxury of time. We're in the middle of a live pandemic. There is a huge potential for additional spikes of this and for the pandemics. So lessons learned have to be learned rapidly. Can you give us some more detail in terms of what that entails and how that operates, um, that initiative? Uh, certainly, Chair. And I think, you know, while taking that, that point, and I think we've said in the past, you know, in regards to inquiries, you know, I, I have no doubt there will be local, national, international inquiries into this. But now is the time for learning. And I think your point is right. It's where we learn and what we do now. I think it was Professor um, Cyan Griffiths, who said to, to your committee when she appeared here uh, to do the, the analysis post hoc and not to have that blame culture. So that's very much what this rapid learning initiative is about. It's going to be led by, by the chief nursing officer, and, and its main aims will be the changes that have already been implemented within the health and social care system, the impact of the interventions to date on COVID 19 transmission within care homes and other safety and experience indicators determined to, to be significant. So the main objectives that the group will consider um, the following key areas in care homes, the first being the experience of patients, residents, staff, and the families of those who have people in care homes. The second will be the symptom monitoring and intervention on care planning. Um, third, in infection and prevention control. The fourth is actually physical distancing of residents taking into consideration their, their conditions and also the, the isolation cohort, cohorting, visiting restrictions, staff turnover and footfall. So the, the group itself is about developing, to develop and monitor uh, measurement processes that will assist in undertaking the current system, develop a learning system that will facilitate scale and spread, and seek to identify early evidence as it becomes available in real time in order to scale and spread those measures which demonstrate impact of actually controlling COVID-19 and care home residents and staff. So it is about getting those professionals in, seeing what has been done and getting that learning back, back as soon as possible. And it's been led by the, by the chief nursing officer. It will also have the main steering group as well, will have input as well from um, independent care home providers as well. So uh, Pauline Shepherd will be a member of it uh, from the independent care home providers uh, and there'll be a num num number of other all the professionals taking up that as well. Up, up that, uh, you know, our chief pharmaceutical officer will be there for a point of view as well. It's, Chair, so that's the main. I suppose that's that. That's the bones of, of what that, that is. It's already started its work, so we hope to get that that within weeks. It will be weeks rather than rather than months, Chair. And that that focuses quite a bit, Robin, on on what's happening in care homes right now. But will it look at what could have been done different to prevent yep. the? Uh, and, and Chair, we'll also look at international practice as well, because it is about learning what we can do and what we need to do if there's a second surge, how we prevent it getting COVID-19 getting back into our care homes. And so, so it is, it's, it's quite an intensive piece of work that's been done over a very short space of time. I think that's the, the title, you know, that rapid learning initiative, because it is about learning. Okay. Thank you. Um, my second question then is, is to Ian. Um, uh, you made it public, Ian. Well, well, first of all, can you give us a quick background, a, a quick background in, in your own background in terms of public health, and then in relation to you had made it public that you were on long-term sick leave throughout, I think, the period of March. So, can you explain to us what your membership of Sage entailed and who was representing us at that period of time if you were if you were off? Okay. So, first of all, um, in terms of my own background, I'm a, a clinician. Um, specifically trained in oratory medicine um, with an interest in diagnostics, nutrition and um, management of lipids, um, cholesterol, etc. predominantly. I have been Professor of Medicine at Queen's University for around 20 years and for a significant proportion of that time 
was director of the Center for Public Health, which is one of the university's main research centers. I was appointed as chief scientific advisor to the Department of Health in 2015. That's a part-time role. Um, main responsibilities are for research and development and to provide <coughs> general scientific input and advice where required and as head of profession for healthcare scientists for one of the components of the health and social care workforce. In terms, when I, you're correct, I have publicly let it be known that I was off on long-term sick leave and returned to work towards the end of March. And at that stage, I joined SAGE as a member representing Northern Ireland. Um, from the first meeting of SAGE, which I attended, I was there as a full participant um, with the ability to ask questions and participate fully in discussion, as are the other expert members. Um, prior to my involvement in SAGE, um, SAGE have now released, I believe, almost all of their minutes and their papers going right back to the beginning of the current epidemic. And that information is therefore publicly accessible via the SAGE website. Um, it does not indicate that there were any Northern Ireland members in attendance as participants, but I believe that the SAGE papers would have been available. Is it, is it therefore the case that there was no one from here represented on SAGE at the crucial time around the 12th and 13th of March, when I, the decision was taken to end contact tracing? To the best of my knowledge, and I have asked, I don't believe there was anyone from Northern Ireland present at those SAGE meetings where those discussions took place. And what's your thoughts on that as, as Chief Scientific Advisor? So I think my preference would have been that Northern Ireland was actively involved in the discussions at all stages. The purpose of SAGE is to review the science and to provide advice based on the science. Um, it's not to make policy decisions. So I think that the decision to stop testing on part of UK government was a policy decision rather than one that was based on scientific um, advice and took account of the realities of the situation um, at the time in terms of the stage of the epidemic. Would it be your understanding that the scientific advice from SAGE was not to stop the contact tracing? Well, um, all I can do is look back at the minutes from SAGE, um, as others can do. I believe the SAGE um, view from the beginning, and certainly my view <coughs> in terms of the science, is that testing is one very important component of our approach to the virus, that we should conduct as much testing as possible and as frequently as possible. The challenge is that this is a virus for which there was no test at all six months ago. So we're moving from a position of zero possibility of testing through to a position now where there's huge demand for tests and testing right across the world. And even today, there is a global short shortage of test materials and test kits. Um, but sorry, sorry, and well, well, firstly, my understanding is from from previous uh, discussions at the very outset of this, we had a capacity here for testing, and we're doing in fact test 40 a day. Now that was limited, but that has been scaled up as time has went on. But my question is more around the contact tracing and the decision to stop contact tracing, or indeed to stop building up the contact tracing. Uh, uh, resilience that we had or the, or the structure we had in place to do contact tracing? My understanding of the SAGE minutes, and again I have to emphasise that I wasn't there or participating in the discussion, is that at that time it was felt that there were too many cases occurring in the UK and that there was not sufficient capacity mm -hmm. to contact trace in order to suppress the infection and that additional measures would need to be taken and that came in the form of social distancing and what's generally referred to as the lockdown, which has indeed been effective in terms of suppressing the course of the epidemic. But there would have been an awareness that there will be other stages to come 
where we will need contact tracing as an alternative, and that should have that should have indicated that we continue to build up our capacity. Absolutely. So the Sage advice again, if you look through the minutes, and certainly since I have been attending Sage minutes and Sage and participated in discussions, it's been absolutely clear that test, trace, protect, or whatever name you want to apply to a strategy, is absolutely critical as we move forwards and attempt to release the lockdown and to prevent further expansion of the epidemic. Okay, and Robin, were you not concerned that we didn't have representation on SAGE at that point? Well, I suppose at that point, Chair, Chair we were getting feedback through COBRA from, from SAGE. Um, we had, a, a, I suppose, part-time observer status on it but when we needed, but we were getting SAGE advice was coming in through COBRA, which was being attended by myself, First Minister and Deputy First Minister, so the advice was coming the Cobra as a body general. But we weren't inputting our particular circumstances, that's the problem. Well, Not the advice coming out, yeah. it's the advice going in I'm, I'm more concerned well, about. Well, that's, at, at that point, in the Chair, I was under the, under the impression that we had observer status and we were sitting on some of those meetings, actually seeing what was going on, unable to input, able to write in questions, but not actually participate because Ian wasn't there as our full-time member. Okay, and... Uh, I have asked for those qu the questions that were being asked at the time to be provided. Uh, I, I don't know where we are in that, Chair. I, 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 I would like I would like I, that expedited, Robin. Please, yeah. it's going on quite a while. Um, the, the final one for me before I go to members then is in relation to the 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 process the, the system in place now at the minute to take account of easements as they're done and the, the testing and tracing, which will tell us in 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 time to react. How, how does that contact tracing system link to the decision-making process or the R number at the present time? Okay. So, um, if I can yeah, address, I mean, address yeah. that. Um, at the moment, um, anyone who has COVID symptoms should be getting a test. So, that's anybody with a new continuous cough, an elevated temperature, or a change in the sense of taste or smell. Now, obviously, we are fully dependent on the cooperation of the general public to <coughs> recognise the fact that they have those symptoms, to declare it, and then to get tested. Whenever somebody does that, they're advised to self-isolate, along with the members of their household, until the result of the test comes through, which typically should be within 48 hours. And once the result of the test is made available, then if the test result is negative, um, so the individual has symptoms but not COVID, and that would be the case for most people with symptoms, then the individual and their household can go back about their normal business. If the test result is positive, then the individual receives the result and is contacted by the Trace Test and Protect Service to identify all of their contacts um, to whom they were exposed within the 48 hours prior to them developing symptoms. So those individuals in turn then are contacted and they are advised to self-isolate for a period of 14 days. Uh, my my question is more aimed at, at establishing what capacity we have uh, in relation to the transmission rate. What, what is the transmission rate at the present time? So, to answer the first part of that question, we have capacity in test, trace and protect to contact trace everybody who has a positive test result. And that is happening at the moment. I'm not totally sure what you mean by the um, transmission of the epidemic. The R, the R, the the R, R number. Right. Well, as was indicated by the um, executive last week, R was sitting between 0 0.8 and 1.0, and we've agreed that we will be publishing a value for R once per week, which I believe will be on Thursday night or Friday of this week. Okay, so on present numbers of contact tracers, what increase in prevalence could we deal with? What, what increase in that number could we deal with in terms of full contact tracing for all relative Contact, contact. So the modelling for the development of the <coughs> contact tracing service at the moment has allowed um, to contact trace for at least 300 cases a day with up to 10 contacts per case. The 
the service is um, planning at the moment and recruiting and training so that it can flex in response to any future in um, increase in cases. Um, obviously, we continue to model the likely transmission of the epidemic in the future, and we bring forward um, different recommendations if we felt that that capacity was likely to be exceeded. But for the moment, based on all of the data with, that we have, that's the current planning assumption. Chair, can I maybe just give you the updates there? Uh, on site at this moment in time, we have 102, um, and they're made up from people who've been reassigned from multiple, multiple departments um, whose work have paused, uh, coming from a number of backgrounds, including PHA nurses, health improvement staff, trust nursing staff, environmental health officers. Um, the recruitment campaign for contact tracers actually closes today. And that will be for you know the department staff who will be in post for a year with an option for a second year, and the level two core contact tracers uh, that we'll be looking for will be from a nursing or environmental health background, because you know this isn't just a call centre. I'm aware, no, I think we're aware of other regions that have went from a very much call centre based. We're looking as these these people will be able to give advice and guidance rather than just you've got a positive case, please go and get another, another, another test. So we've offered a contract already for two of the environmental health officers who are in post, and we've 20 retired nurses um, who were ward sisters, lead nurses, or actually assistant directors of nursing, uh, and they're starting their training next week, so that'll add another layer. Uh, we've secured four doctors who will be there working alongside the contact tracers, so they're actually given, uh, be able to give that medical advice and it's going to be led by a health protection consultant. So th this isn't just about contacting, this is about providing that next step, which is the support and guidance as well that, that people need, because what, what we're finding, or, or what the experience already is, you know, to give that message over the phone, uh, it's quite a, quite a daunting message to, for somebody to receive. So we want to be able to make sure that the people who are on the other end of the phone are able to do that in a way that is supportive and also provides guidance as well. So that, that's where we're at, at currently. So the recruitment for the full-time post is actually finished today, and that's where we're, we'll go to the next stage. We're looking um, also there's a business case in for a second premises as well. This time, at this moment in time, we're operating out of the, the PHA headquarters in Limpole Street. And how many have been recruited, or how many are going to be recruited? There's a hundred, I, I don't have the final. I don't have the final. I don't have the final. We have 102 on site there, or okay. po possibly... Can, can come in on site depending as but as clearly the flex the flex that Ian described is going to require dial up more. or dial down depending on the number of positive cases that oh. come through. Okay, we can come back to that, I think, but I want to go to members now to give members, so I'll give members all a kind of an equal time. We have about an hour for this session, a bit, a bit less. I'd ask members to be as brief as, and as succinct as possible with your questions, and both Ian and Robin, yourself as well. If, if members feel that the, the question they have asked has not been misunderstood or a different question or whatever, um, I, will, I will allow people to come in and say, listen, I'm actually trying to establish this, just for the purposes of getting through as much business as we can. So I'm going to go, first of all, to Colin. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and I know I was gesticulating early there because I have a committee meeting at two that I am chairing and I will need to, to leave sharpish to, to, to go off and get the prep done for that. And I thank both of the uh, members for coming along today to give us the information. And also, I, I definitely acknowledge, Minister, that you have appeared regularly in front of this committee and in front of the House, and um, you know, that has been welcome because it has given us an opportunity to have a direct conversation with yourself and, and various officers. Uh, and just to say, that I'm glad to see that uh, if there was mention of long-term sickness, glad to see the chief uh, scientific officer back as well. Um, one of the questions that I wanted just to ask about was: uh, I've had a couple of concerns raised with me uh, from members of the BAME uh, community, um, and because they're feeling like they're a wee bit more susceptible uh, to contracting coronavirus, and that the outcomes for such patients can uh, be less. Uh, less favourable than for others. And I think Public Health England announced yesterday um, that they indicate that there's between a 10 and 50 per cent increased chance of death uh, when compared for others. And given that here our trusts do uh, you know, rely very heavily on members of, of, of that community to, to provide that frontline work, and that the, at the exact moment in time, the trusts are unable to sort of really divert them away from the front line because they say that there's no uh, evidence to indicate that they, there's a, a problem there. 
is there an opportunity for us here to undertake some piece of research to determine that and to help members of that background by maybe diverting them into some sort of role that isn't just as like isn't in the ICU units, for example? Well, uh, Colin, Ian, Ian's nodded at me that he wants to answer this one, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to, say, going to going to stand in his way. But what, what I would just like to draw, Chair, if I could, just very briefly, is that the public health agency has done a bit of of research into our own prevalence of cases here in Northern Ireland, and they published that last week. And I think it's one of, one of the indicators I would like to bring out, Chair, just at this, is in regards to deprivation category. I think what was actually saw across the rest of, of GB was a high prevalence in the more deprived areas. Actually, what we're seeing in Northern Ireland would be a, a preference towards the least deprived areas. So the more affluent areas of Northern Ireland are seen to have an a small, um, or a small increase compared to other areas in regards to those positive cases. So in Northern Ireland, we're actually seeing the same part of the reverse, but that's not some positive cases. And in regards to the BME, and I'll let you. Yeah, just to say that um, we are very aware of that issue and and are currently seeking to do some research in terms of attempting to d identify the extent of any specific problem in, in Northern Ireland. Um, the PHE report from yesterday was helpful in, in highlighting the increased risk, particularly among the Bangladeshi community, but also and, um, um, among a number of other communities. Some of that appears to be related to uh, an increased prevalence of what I would think of as the more common risk factors. And the, the one that's often not really appreciated or talked about as much as it should be is overweight or obesity, which puts people at quite significant risk of severe complications of the virus if they become um, infected. So, um, yes, we will be looking to do some further work, and I know our trusts are also aware of the issue. Would, would it be something that maybe, uh, even in a short term, some sort of directive that might say that if a member of staff has concerns, that they might be able to be... They're, they're certainly saying they don't want to stay at home. They're just saying that they might be able to go and work, say, for example, in another ward that doesn't deal with coronavirus. But if they're actually working in the ICU and they're having to get dressed up in all the PPE, that they're feeling very vulnerable underneath that, might that be something... And I think in regards to trust in HR, you know, those sort of requests should it be for someone who had underlying conditions or concerns. You know, we're always been addressed, especially during the past number of weeks in you and the... No, I mean, I think just to sort of mention that, fortunately, the incidence in our critical care units is, is very low at the moment. I think we've only six patients in critical care at present. Um, but um, certainly that's a message that we can pass on. Yes. And then just finally, then, um, just, I know that there was a bit much talk there as well about the contact tracing. Um, I, I'm sort of conscious that we're on an island, uh, but we have two health jurisdictions, and that obviously if we're talking about the development of apps, there is that concern that the apps may have difficulty working with each other. And, you know, I don't want this to become a political issue of a, an orange or a green app. You know, I think what we need to be doing here is saying that these apps need to definitely work with each other because for the border communities, for those that are living in, in Letterkenny, Derry, Newry, Dundalk, people are transiting back and forward. They're working, they're interacting with each other, their families live by their side of the border, and it's as important for them that those apps communicate for each other. So could you detail this as what definite work? And I know I'd asked the question of the First Minister uh, two weeks ago, and it was, yes, we want that app, those apps to speak to each other, but has there been definitive work taking place between North and South agencies to make sure that those apps can communicate? It's not just Colin, it's not just North and South, it's also East and West. Um, it's our Chief Information and Digital Officer, Dan West, is actually chairing the, the UK Ireland group on interoperability, which is where the two, two apps will actually be able to, to talk together. But what, what I want to say at this time and at the time is that we're concentrating on contact tracing. We're, we're we're concentrating on putting the people on the end of the phone in offices rather than relying on the app because we are aware of the concerns of just the, the operation of the app. You have to have it on, Bluetooth, drains your battery. You know, there's all those things that are making it unattractive at this moment in time. So the focus is on the contact trace and on the people on the end of the phone. And I think the app has been the, you know, described even at a, a UK health minister as the icing and the cake rather than something that we should be getting to too caught up on, and I think our contact tracing system at this moment in time has proven effective because of the number of positive cases. Ian, do you want to? 
Yes, just to say that I think the potential role of the app um, in contact tracing is, is often overstated. At best, it's going to be an adjunct. Um, you know, even if you have 50% of the population using the app, which would be a considerable achievement, um, then it's only going to pick up 25% of contacts automatically. So we're always going to be relying on the manual contact tracing as the core of our activity in this area. That if, if the app isn't using use the contact tracing, uh, you know, as in bringing people and checking out, is there an establishment for that to work north and south so that if you've got people that are based in Lemon Hall Street in Belfast but here that there's people that they're in contact that live in Letterkenny, will that be allowed to happen? And will Brexit play an impact in that given that there will be difficulties of sharing of information come? No, because we, we, we have the underwrite, we can share information on their medical grounds. Anyway, and our relationship between PHA and HSE was always there, Colin, it's always been established. If you go back, I think I've used this example before, the first case we had in Northern Ireland was of someone who landed in Dublin Airport travelled up. So the two organisations have a long established ability to, to, to talk to each other, especially in our contact tracing. Contact tracing isn't new, we always had that small group, because what they dealt with in the past were you know, things like TB, food poisoning outbreaks, STI outbreaks as well. So there always was a small cohort that was doing that. And that conversation always went on north, south, east, west. So it's an, on, under a memorandum of understanding, you know, we have that sharing of knowledge. Small point, Sub Yes, uh, just a small point on that. Um, uh, obviously, that sharing of knowledge is very, very important. Uh, and certainly, as of last week, I was made aware of um, the, the locator form. Um, which is um, available in the Republic of Ireland, uh, at that point did not uh, require anybody travelling to Northern Ireland to even fill out the form. Um, it, has that been addressed? Has that changed? Or, and you know, is that cooperation as full as it can possibly be to ensure that we actually know that people have travelled yeah. when they're coming into Northern that, Ireland? That conversation is ongoing, and I suppose it comes on to a further point later on when we develop our own form for asking people to self-isolate for 14 days. So the conversation has gone on north and south to make sure the two systems are are compatible and, and we're giving the same advice to, to whoever lands. But, you know, should there be somebody land in Belfast, travel to Dublin, or somebody land in Dublin? Because there are there are specific guidances that will be specific to each jurisdiction, but the 14-day um, self-isolation is going to be a requirement for both. It's not mandatory yet, no. No, it's not. So it's not resolved yet? It's not resolved yet, no. But it's been worked on at it's been worked on at um, executive office level yeah. along with, with T shops office as well because it's just just for clarity, Chair, that means that if somebody's travelling from a, a particularly um, troubled part of the world which has an awful lot of COVID <coughs> cases, um, they could come in if if they live in Northern Ireland, they could come in through Dublin Airport, for example, not have to fill in the form, travel into Northern Ireland and we don't know that they've arrived or where they've been. That, that's that's correct, but that's because that travel, you know, we don't have that travel advice in, in the UK yet, no matter where they're landing from. So it's just about it's about the sharing of the information, and if anybody's coming from 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 an area like that, if it's the, it's the usual guidance, Pam, if you know if they have symptoms or they feel symptomatic, it's the, it's the self isolation guidance that we give them. Ian, do you want to? No, I think it's it's the same whether it's London or Dublin or whatever. They at the moment we don't require that. Okay, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, Minister, um, where are we in relationship to shielding letters? Um, because they're up to a certain point, and will that will there be a reissuing of those letters? And if so, will it be to the same people and indeed maybe include diabetic people with diabetes? Um, it's just I'm starting to get people who've got shielding letters, and their employers are actually starting to ask them when are they coming back to work. So obviously that's a bit of a worry because we're really not out of this pandemic yet. So that's my first question. And also my second question to you, Minister, is in light of the events that happened in Ballyhome Beach and Crawfordsburn and Helms Bay and other places, is there a fear that there could be a surge in COVID-19 cases in several weeks' time because of those uh, actions which are of great concern and I'm sure you would agree with me that they really shouldn't be happening. Yeah. No, and and your, your second question, Alex, yeah, yes, there is a concern because you know, the guidance is there. You know, 
uh, two metre distance, six foot apart, social social exclusions, you know, all the rest of it is there for a reason. And it's there for a reason, no matter what age and he was in, as I said yesterday in the press conference, you know, I understand the frustrations of young people having been locked up for so long, having the opportunity now to go out and meet in groups of six and then the guidance has to go out and meet in groups of six and be socially distanced, it's not to go out and have half mad, mad parties and beaches because, you know, that's where the threat comes in. Young people may not be the ones who lose their lives to this disease, but it may be someone they love. They can take it back into their homes. They can spread it through their families. So the guidance still is, you know, please, please respect the social distancing. Please travel where necessary. You know, this isn't uh, this isn't an extended summer holiday. You know, we're asking people to stay off, home, stay at home, stay off work. Uh, people are furloughed for a reason, and that's why we combat COVID-19 and the spread of it throughout Northern Ireland. In regards to, to the shielding, we are aware that you know, the, the first set of shielding letters do come to an end very soon. The Chief Medical Officer is, is leading a group which involves a number of stakeholders. Uh, the Public Health Agency issued uh, a call last night for you know, anybody who wanted to give an input as to what they thought the next shielding process should look like, what should be included in the letters. Um, we haven't determined how long the next shielding period will be for yet. That's been done at a, a CMO. Uh, UK level. There is also an assessment on the conditions um, that will be asked to, to shield those who are most vulnerable or most susceptible to COVID-19, um, and that's adding on on what we now know compared to when the first letters were, were actually issued. So it's a reassessment of the conditions that were included in the first letter and the possibility of, of adding further ones, but those letters are, are due to issue very shortly, you know, will be issued within the next couple of weeks. Ian, do you want to in regards to I mean, I, I think obviously those who have been shielding have, um, you know, given up a considerable sacrifice and have suffered significantly as a result of that. So, I think there's a desire to try to give more nuanced advice to support people in terms of making um, decisions. The risk to an individual who's shielding, if they contract the virus, remains as severe as it has ever been. But as the level of virus um, transmission is much lower in the community, then their risk of being exposed to it is less than it was in the past. And I think that's what may allow the more nuanced advice that is currently being discussed. And, and, an issue has arisen to, that, that, and this would need to be considered, I suppose, is in a case where someone is shielding and their carer while not shielding, is an essential worker and is working in circumstances which are very unsafe. There would appear to be a lack of understanding in some in some settings. So I think carers there need to be considered and the impact their caring role has on the shielded person. So yeah, that no, can be considered as part of that. Fair point, yeah. Okay, uh, Paula, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming along this morning. Minister, my question, first question is to you. Two weeks ago, um, when you last came to Health Committee, I raised the issue of families who have children with disabilities living at home, who are at the end of their tether, um, who were looking for some um, flexibility around their direct care payments and um, around the use of that money and the updated guidance. Rightly so, uh, my phone has flared up over the last um, 12 hours from the debate last night in the Assembly. People are very insulted. and. Um, because obviously they're really struggling during this pandemic. So we can't say that we support families who are providing support to children with disabilities if we're not going to follow through at a time like this. Where is that information and when are those families going to get the support they need? I haven't I haven't had a direct update on that, Paula. I thought there would have been guidance out to you from, from our from our last meeting. Um I, again again I'll get back uh, and check where that where that actually is in the direct payments. I thought I know it has been looked at within the department, but I haven't got an, an actual answer as to where the where that's change in payment structure is. But I'll get it to you. Please do, Minister. No, I understand. Um, the second question is to you, um, Professor Young, and it's really about how do we take account as we go forward through the tracing for those people who don't have any symptoms. Um, obviously, as uh, Alex Easton was just mentioning there, obviously all the children are congregating, going home, you know. And then there's groups of six. How do we then take account, as I say, of um, those people who, who are factors as opposed to being symptoms? So um, I think the fact that a significant proportion of people with COVID are asymptomatic 
or have very little in the way of symptoms is one of the main challenges in relation to our future control of this epidemic. You know, if you give me a magic wand and infinite testing, I would test everybody in the population every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, that would provide us with a mechanism to bring this under control. So we can't do that. Um, certainly, we're currently considering the possibility of um, more widespread testing in higher risk settings. And there will be research underway in England. They have decided to open their schools, as we're aware, in June. So there will be a, a program of work undertaken to look at what sort of surveillance and testing might be possible in the context of schools. Um, in order to pick up the asymptomatic infection, particularly among, among children. And we'll have an opportunity, I hope, to learn from that experience before our own schools open near the end of, um, of August. Um, the best guess at the moment is that about one third of individuals will be asymptomatic. And um, our hope is that by focusing on the symptomatic individuals by identifying them and isolating them all and their contacts, that that will be of sufficient impact to you know, negate the positive um, spread which comes from asymptomatic individuals. That's why we need contact people who are contacts to self-isolate for 14 days. People might think, but I feel fine, nothing wrong with me. Um, why do you want me to isolate for 14 days? Well, it's exactly because they may be an asymptomatic person with the virus, and if they don't self-isolate, then there's the risk that they will spread it. Can I just have a very quick cut supplementary? Are we going to be able to move then to 24 hours, getting the test results back? Because I think that would have people complying a bit more if, if, if they could get the answers quite quickly. Yes, that is absolutely a goal for um, to have test results back within 24 hours. Um, there's a testing group which are pushing very hard for that. Um, in order for the service to work, really we need 80% of contacts to be told to self-isolate and to do that within 48 hours of the first test on the case. So that needs us to get a test result back in 24 hours for that to work properly. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, sorry, can I, I just yep. Sorry, Paul, my apologies. Uh, we wrote to the committee this morning the letter that can back has a, an answer to your, your question in regards to direct payment. So, 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 so it is there. Apologies. I just, in an I, inbox somewhere? I just, uh, well, it's, it was just sent to the committee this morning, so they'll have it for you as well. So there is, is guidance there. The department have been working with trusts on service users to develop that guidance. So there's a there's a paragraph there for you, so it's, it's what the committee does. Thank you. Jerry. <coughs> uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, two questions, uh, first around care homes and then one on uh, contact tracing. Um, Minister, obviously you announced £11.2 million extra for, for care homes uh, yesterday, including money around um, sick pay for staff. I mean, that, that will provide some relief for, for underpaid and uh, undervalued staff for so many years, but there's a concern about the regulation of this, especially uh, with the revelations in the Spotlight programme last night, uh, in particular around uh, Clifton uh, and Runwood, um, especially when, when Runwood previously, um, in 2018, RQIA um, found that they had no washing powder, no washing liquid, um, yet senior executives were being paid £17 million pounds, uh, when they left the company. So I think there's a concern that everybody, I think, accepts that care workers, uh, people working in care homes, should get paid a fair wage but that public money continually going to private care homes when they're making uh, large numbers of profit is not only unfair but unsustainable. Uh, so how do we ensure that uh, these companies um, do pay their staff uh, sick pay uh, and they're not just protecting their own profits uh, throughout this, uh, this pandemic? Jerry, I think in, in regards to the, to the specific uh, being able to pay people um, sick pay up to 80% of the the value is because we were aware that some of those providers were relying basically statutory sick pay. So there was people being put in a position whether it was actually come into work or, or not be paid. Many of them in zero hours contracts as well. So that's what this this allocation of, of over three million pounds is specifically for and it is targeted. It must go towards those people who are off due to COVID positive or because they're self isolating as well. It's part of how that money will be allocated and, and, and spent as well. 
that, so that's that's the main thing in regards to you know specifically about, about a group of homes. Unfortunately, where we sit at this minute in time, each home is a standalone entity, and I have no power no power within the department to look at a, a group of homes as to how the overall management structure is, is working. We can we can only look at individual homes rather than rather than the group itself. But I've asked officials to look at how we can change that. So if there is concerns about a provider rather than a specific home, we can start to take um, actions and redress the concerns over the entire group rather than specific home. I think there is, Minister. Um I mean, especially around Clifton in 2013, there was um, infection prevention concerns raised in, in, in 2013. Uh, obviously, it was before your time, but I think there's a, a, a systemic uh, problem and a, a lack of focus on people feeling on care homes. Uh, but in, in, in regards to the contact tracing, um, I think you have previously mentioned, Minister, about the need for a, a single app uh, to be used uh, across the islands. I think it, it is your preference. I mean, obviously, I think people, everybody accepts we need contact tracing to happen and a system in, in place, but there's been a number of concerns raised by human rights organisations, Amnesty International in particular, um, about the UK having a, a single uh, central state database. My understanding is that other states have decentralised uh, databases, so there's a concern around surveillance, around data breaches, um, and in particular, um, do you know when the data uh, will be deleted uh, after it's collected? Um, we're looking at our own app. Jerry, you know, as I said, our chief digital information officer is actually looking to establish a Northern Ireland app um, because of the concerns there are with, with the NHSX when uh, widely shared. We are still working with the NHSX, uh, as are the Scottish and the Welsh, to see concerns can be worked out and those um, dealt with um, accordingly. While that work is ongoing, we're also looking at how we develop our own here in Northern Ireland that will be able to. We'll be sharing the same, same platform with the Irishman as well, so that, that connectivity will be a lot easier. And we'll be Ian, do you want to have enough? No, I think that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And going across now to Pam. Thank you. Thank you for your time here today. I appreciate the good work you're all doing. Um, just briefly, in terms of the shading letters in the back of um, Alex's query, and he he talked about, and I've got many requests in as well from people who have shading letters. Uh, people talking about ha having letters with different dates on them. That's the first thing. Uh, presumably, that doesn't really matter cause, because the situation hasn't changed going forward. But if you could clarify that, and also. I would like to hear what advice you have for people who are being asked to return to work and to return to work soon, given that they are still waiting for that that additional information on shielding. What, what do they do or how do they broach this with their employers? Um, because obviously that's uh, very worrying. Uh, and it's one of those reasons we want to get these, these letters right now as soon as we can so that that guidance can be there. If they're in the receipt of a shielding letter this minute in time, they still should be shielding. That's the guidance. That they have been, you know, that's the guidance they have been given. Um, Ian, do you want to? No, I mean, I, I would agree with that completely. I mean, if somebody is currently in receipt of a shielding letter, they need to shield. And um, I hope any employer would um, support that. Obviously, whenever um, updated letters are issued, um, I think it's possible that there will be more nuance to them and also an attempt to identify categories of people at the highest risk versus somewhat less risk and then there would need to be a discussion between the individual in the context of the new letter with their employer in terms of what is possible but I would hope and expect any employer to be sympathetic and to look at making all reasonable adjustments to help someone to return to work and adhere to the conditions of their shielding. In regards to the dates, um, Pam, the only reason I can think of was um, there was a centralised badge went out through HS, HSC. Um, then GPs were given, well, the GP was given an instruction, but then GPs were given a, a leniency as well to issue individual or specific cohorts of letters within their own practices as well. So that could explain the, the, the slight difference in dates is there as well. But when we issue the, the one, that same process will probably be in place. Okay. Uh, so um, when that shielding. Um Further advice is issued. That'd be very welcome. Will employers receive guidance on how to deal with yeah. with 
um, employees who you have shielding letters. Yeah. No, the, the same as we did before. It'll be, it'll be a general message as, as to how you support those who are shielding. And Professor Young, I welcome what you said about uh, the nuanced approach, because obviously, uh, whilst the, the threat is just as big from COVID-19 to those people who are being told to shield, but as you say, if, if the incidents are kept very low and we're keeping it from each other, that also reduces the risk, which is very welcome. And I suppose the, the reason why I, I, I went back on that shielding um, uh, information that we need is because of you know people who have shielding letters who have some serious medical conditions who are, are very much at risk, but the employers that um, are asking them to come back to work and come back to work soon are uh, what I would imagine to be in quite high risk areas such as supermarkets. Um, I wonder if you have any comment in, uh, specifically as to the type of work places or type of work that um, shielders need to avoid? I, mean, I think for those who are shielding, it, it, it's difficult to give general advice. It depends on the risk, really, for the individual. Within the category of people who have been told to shield, there are some who are really at extremely high risk, and effectively they may need to continue to shield. And then there will be others who are at high risk, but the risk is, is lower. They'll be closer to the advice that we currently give to the vulnerable groups, so the over 70s, those with underlying conditions who aren't shielding, which is that it's particularly important for them to adhere to the social distancing and other recommendations that we put in, in, in place. In general, I think for individuals who are vulnerable, I would hope that it's possible for them, depending on their level of vulnerability, to avoid being in occupational roles which involve risk of high frequency contacts at relatively close proximity with others. And that certainly might um, apply to some retail settings, but not all retail settings. So we, we need solutions to be worked out by sympathetic employers with the interests of their employees in mind and hopefully agreed between them. Okay, that's useful, thank you. And my, my second uh, question was on um, underlying health conditions of those who've lost their lives due to COVID-19 and the, that recording. Um, so are underlying health conditions, um, are they recorded along with the COVID-19 death and should they be? And why are some of the death certificates ascribing COVID-19 being questioned? And are the levels of complaint in that regard, have they, are they higher than they would, you would normally expect them to be? So um, I'm, I'm not involved in looking at the death certif um, certificates or death certification process that's dealt with elsewhere in the department. All doctors um, have been given direction in terms of how to report and record um, deaths, and they should be following that direction both in relation to COVID and in relation to other conditions. I think in terms of um, underlying conditions, if a doctor feels that that has contributed to the patient's death, then that should be recorded as part of the death certification process. Um, there is an element of judgment involved on the part of individual practitioners. Um, so there may be some variation in relation to that. We have, in addition, um, for many of the deaths, um, a much more detailed um, capturing of all underlying health conditions um, as part of national sur surveillance. So that's what, what gives us the um, strongest information about what are the underlying conditions which particularly um, predispose to severe COVID. Uh, In regards, I think as well, you know, you were talking about the concerns on the death certificate. I, I, I know I've signed a letter uh, to all members in regards to should, should a family have a concern that COVID is recorded on the death certificate where they don't believe it could be or it should be actually there. So there is a there is a, a process there that people can actually query okay, as well. So that has been issued. Okay, thank you. Um, and I suppose just on the back of your answer, Professor, um, just thinking in terms of, for instance, the Diabetes UK letter that came in, and they, they, the, you know, obviously, the more data we have going forward to be able to drill down on, on what the vulnerabilities actually might be in, in people, would it 
would it not make more sense that actually some kind of direction would go out that <coughs> as much detail as possible should be recorded on these death certificates so that we have the information to decipher and examine and investigate going forward? So there, there, there is in fact limited space on a death certificate to, and we need much more detailed information than it would be possible to put on a, a death certificate. So that's why we rely on other sources of information to capture that. And that really these are national studies which have been approved and where we're collecting data on tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of COVID patients in terms of underlying conditions and their clinical course. Um, and much of that information is available through the public domain. It's published in scientific papers, so it's not necessarily the most accessible. But, um, you know, it does enable us to get very comprehensive information about underlying risk factors. Okay, and can I just finally on that, just ask, in your opinion, is there a greater risk uh, to the diagnosis of diabetes? Yes, there is an increased risk um, of severity of COVID for patients with diabetes. Diabetes itself is a very broad label, and you know, there are people with, um, let's, I don't like saying mild diabetes, but diabetes which can be controlled by diet alone, which doesn't require medication or insulin. Probably the extra risk there is relatively modest compared to some people who have much more complex or unstable diabetes, where the risk is likely to be greater. So even within something like diabetes, there's a considerable gradation of risk in the context of, yes, some overall risk. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm going to go now to Pat, but I just want to flag up to Orlea on the phone that I'll come to her next, and then have Alan indicating. So we'll go across to Pat now. Thanks, Joe. Uh, uh, and thanks uh, for your presentations. And answering the questions. I just wanted to take you back to the 12th of March decision, and You said it was a policy decision. It wasn't uh, a decision taken by SAGE. Uh, and I mean, at, at that time, transmission rates were fairly high in London and, and the southeast of England in particular. So, I mean, some would argue that the policy decision taken was the right decision because the system was being overwhelmed by the numbers. That wasn't the case here. On the 12th of March, uh, there were only 47 positive cases of COVID-19 here in the north. So whilst the policy decision was taken in the, uh, across the water and there are clear uh, reasons why it could be argued it was the right decision. Uh, that's not the case here. So wh why did we make a similar decision? Because the decision was obviously ours. Uh, we have a devolved health system here. So wh what exactly happened? I'd like to understand what the process was there. So um, unfortunately, as I've indicated, I was off sick at the time, so wasn't party to the discussions which took place at that stage. So, I mean, because I wasn't there, I don't think it's a question I can really, I can really answer. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if ministers in a position to answer it. Well, I think part is the fact we went into lockdown at the same point as well. And again, it was capacity of who we. You know, you asked the last time I was on how many people did we have? I think we had about 12. Who we could access, and that was full capacity for contact tracing at that time. You know, so we didn't have capacity to do the contact tracing as as we did had that spike. You're right about the 46 cases, but very shortly after that, those numbers started to increase. I suppose I can maybe add, looking back at it, okay, although you have identified a number of cases that were diagnosed at that time, the truth is there would have been a substantially greater number of cases than that because testing capacity was also uh, much more limited at that time. See, the, the difficulty I have with that, Robin, is that <clears throat> on a number of occasions when I have asked this question, was the reason we stopped testing and tracing related to a lack of capacity. And on two occasions when I asked that question, the answer was no. It wasn't related to capacity. So 
you know, it, it's, it's something to out there, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not oh, going to yeah. press on on it, but I, I just want them. Uh, the point I suppose I'm trying to make is whatever is decided across the water is fair enough, and that's up to them. And I, 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 I'm on the record saying I think their decision making from the very outset has been shambolic. Uh, I mean, Messrs. Uh, Johnson, Cummins, Rob, and, and, and Hancock, uh, and, and maybe Messrs is, is a good description for them because it's been an absolute disaster as far as I can see. And, and, and fairness to yourself, I mean, you're eminently much more plausible in dealing with all this. And one thing I would be sure, you've certainly much more integrity than any of those uh, people in, in your dealings with all of this. So, but I, I just want to be clear when there are two completely different contexts, you need different decision-making processes. But just to move on, on to the care homes and the, the spotlight program that was on last night. And the chief medical officer, some old footage of him from the 25th of March saying that uh, in, in care homes where the care and the, the, the resident were asymptomatic, there was absolutely no need for personal protection equipment. Given what we know now about how badly care homes have been affected in this pandemic, do you think the Chief Medical Officer would give the same advice today? And again, Pat, that would be a call for him. But again, it's how we judge this. It's how we judge this pandemic looking back. And I've said before, you know, dealing this through, through hindsight, would we do things differently? Yes. Would we give different advice? Yes. Ian, do you want to... Yeah, I mean, I think I think if you ask for advice now, scientific advice, absolutely, we should be there should be wearing PPE in care homes, regardless of the presence or absence of symptoms, based on um, our scientific understanding of the transmission of the virus. Okay, thanks for that. And, and finally, one short one, just again in relation to the care homes, and and you've mentioned the fact that you don't have the power to do a, a, an overarching investigation into uh, a provider. But I, I would, I think, Robin, you're going to have to look carefully at this issue. And you know yourself, two of the care homes that have been uh, most in the news over the past number of years, the Murray Manor and Ashbrook, are both uh, care homes that were are, are owned and run by, by Runwood. Uh, and Coincidentally, both have had their names changed uh, since all of the, the the bad publicity around them. I mean, that in itself, you know, in my view, is very cynical. This rebranding and renaming uh, to try and, in some way, uh, confuse people about the the history of the place and. Uh, I would ask you to take a look at that as well, and the renaming of, of care homes that have performed badly. Pat, maybe just a bit deeper in that. We're currently undertaking a review um, of the regulatory policy, and we're considering the principles behind regulation, including you know, fundamental questions such as why do we need regulation, what type of regulation is appropriate, and who it should apply to. So rather than just, as I said, to, I was answering Jerry's question, rather than just one home, should it be the entire provider? And the development of a new regulatory framework is being taken forward, and we're taking it forward in two phases, which will offer an opportunity to examine, examine the remit and the role of the RQIA in line with the revised policy. And it's my intention that a proposed policy document setting out the principles of regulation will be issued for consultation actually later this year. So it is about taking that step that you're, you're asking for. We've started that piece of work because we realise it's what we need to do. Okay, thank you. Quickly, Jerry, on that point, I mean, I mean, obviously, Minister, I think RKA, as you say, have, have the power to review and inspect them. I think the problem is that they're inspecting, they're raising issues, uh, but these private care homes are still getting the public money, time after time after time. So issues are being flagged, but the public money and the contract are still going, and people are, are pulling it out as to why it's happening. But, but Jerry, the, the public money that I'm putting into care homes at this moment in time is to support the residents. And, uh, because that's that that's the focus of this minute in time, and we were very specific on where that money, this this budget of money has been targeted. This for staff that need salary, sick pay, um, in regards to, to 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 give that additional support. There's also money being allocated there for the additional cleans as well, so we can get those houses 
sorry, those homes um, that have outbreaks, you know, what through the other side and clear again. So, you know, what it, it's all about <coughs> money. This being and to support the staff and the residents at this minute. It's definitely not about going into operators, operators' pockets. Okay. Thank you. I'm going now to Arlea on the phone. Arlea, are you there? Um, uh, whenever Pat Sheehan was asking his first question, my um, my phone just went went silent. It, it keeps cutting out every now and again, so I couldn't hear what Pat had asked. But I'm assuming it was the it was along the same lines as the question that I was I was going to ask myself um, around the how the scientific evidence of the North was represented at that stage meeting in mid March. Um, you know, around the, the statistics of our own levels of transmission and our own capacity to deal with contact tracing at that time. But from what I've heard from the responses from the chief um, scientific advisor and the minister, um, I, I'm assuming that that's, that's what Pat had already addressed. So yeah. um, I'll maybe just move on to um, a few other questions. This one for the minister, please. Um, Robin, I was just wondering, it's been brought to our attention, do you intend to bring forward any plans for um, rehabilitation for patients recovering from COVID-19? Um, I know that there's been some appointments that have been made already in Scotland and Wales um, where they have appointed a, a rehabilitation lead. Um, and I think they've actually um, they have um, taken the lead from the, the chief allied health professions. So I'm not sure if the department have had a wee think about that or if you're planning anything similar. We are looking at that, um, that opportunity because we do really know this is a new virus. We have to make sure that people who have come through it are supported. And, and earlier, it's not just from, I suppose, the physical respiratory um, fallout of the condition as well. There, there's also a mental health impact as well of those people who have been through the trauma of having COVID-19 because it is highly stressing, not just for them, but for their families as well. So it's make, making sure that when we look about how we support uh, patients who, who have come through COVID-19, that there is that sort of greater uh, mental support as well, rather than just solely physical. Yeah, thank, thank you, Minister, and, and thank you for making the reference to, um, you know, the mental health element, because this is, you know, the the genuine party of esteem any time we're talking about physical health we know that there's a mental health element to it so I appreciate that um, and then maybe just finally my last question is the with the, the new process of um, contact tracing is there capacity to contact trace all suspected cases or will it just be those who have um, come into contact with someone who has had a positive lab result it's just at this moment in time it's from a positive lab result Thank you, Minister. Yeah, yeah, just to add to that, um, again, what I said earlier, everybody who has symptoms needs to get a test. Um, there is a web link available through the PHA website, and the number is 119. But we need everybody with symptoms to get tested. Okay, thank you. Alan? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, the comment I'm going to make here is, is will obviously be no consolation to the families of those who have lost a, a loved one uh, to this dreadful virus, uh, and they obviously will continue to be in our thoughts. Um, I suppose it's it's easy to look back and, and find fault, um, and I'm sure that going forward, uh, useful lessons will have been learned. Um, but I would say that there has been a a public recognition uh, of the fact that our health authorities have got a lot of things right uh, so far uh, in this process, and people are grateful for that fact. Um, just my question is that, you know, uh, uh, as a matter of, of due diligence, I'm sure that you are all working towards uh, the potential of having to deal uh, with a further outbreak. Um, and my question is, is it inevitable uh, that there will be another outbreak? And do we still have the potential that it could be an outbreak that could be an out-of-control surge, the sort of thing that we feared might have happened uh, at the start back in, in March? We thought this was a possibility. And it, just, a, a, I suppose, a small question, just to see a lot of employers uh, 
checking the temperature of their staff every morning getting into work. Um, I'm not questioning the wisdom of it, but just asking, is that a useful filter? Okay, I'll, I'll let, you know, pick up your first point about you know, getting things right. Um, if we put things in context, you know, we're, we're sitting here at the start of June. At the start of January, we had our nurses and our healthcare professionals were in strike in Northern Ireland. So what our health service has come through, stepped up to and delivered over the past five months, I, I think is unbelievable. Um, the, the professionalism and the dedication of everyone across that sector is, I think, something that we should all be actually a proud, proud of and amazed that they actually have got us to a stage uh, where we are. In regards to the inevitability um, of, of a second surge, uh, uh, Professor Young will, will talk about the science, but from, from a personal point of view, I hope it's not. That's why we're still asking people to take those basic steps, two metres, washing your hands, good respiratory hygiene, follow the guidance that's there, because if we can get these next two, three months, if we can achieve as much as we achieved in the past two or three months in regards to where we are now and the number of, of deaths and the number of positive cases, the number of ICU admissions, if we can keep that three and going, I think Northern Ireland will be in a, in a very good place in June. So, so there is certainly potential for another outbreak. That will remain the case until we have substantial levels of immunity in the population, probably at least 70 or 80 per cent population immunity would be required. At the moment, best estimates of population immunity in Northern Ireland are that it's probably around 5 per cent. We'll have some accurate figures on that, I hope, later this month. Um, so either we need a vaccine, which works, or we will continue to have the potential for another outbreak. I hope, given all the measures in place and the way we're now monitoring things, that it would not be an outbreak of such severity as would overwhelm the system. But um, anything remains possible. And the risk, I think, while it exists at present, will be greater in the autumn and winter months, given the pattern of other similar um, respiratory viruses. With regard to temperature monitoring, this is something which we've looked at through our own strategic intelligence group in the department, reviewed the evidence. It suggests that you may pick up around one quarter of people who are currently infectious through checking um, the temperature, but at the price of identifying a lot of people who aren't infectious and telling them to go home and isolate. So it's a matter of judgment, I guess, whether you think it's worthwhile or not. It's also open to manipulation if people wish to do it. Um, you know, put a cold face cloth over your face before your temperature is going to be checked. Take a couple of paracetamol. I hope people wouldn't do those sorts of things, but um, you know, it's something um, which might have some value, but it would be likely to be pretty limited. And generally, I don't think scientifically it's particularly useful at the moment. And I think, uh, in conclusion, uh, that the public, I think the message is the public still have a huge role to play in trying to prevent uh, another outbreak of this virus. Yes, but both in relation to adhering to the restrictions that are in place, the basic precautions, the hand washing, respiratory hygiene, um, social distancing. I'd like to see a lot more people wearing masks. When I visit my local supermarket, I'm almost the only person wearing a mask. I would like to see more people wearing cloth, faith, cloth face coverings in those enclosed locations. And above all, if you have symptoms, you must get tested. Thank you, um, and thank you for all of those answers. There's one thing I suppose does occur to me just before we wrap up. Um, and, and um, I'm glad to hear your reference in Robin the uh, Shan Griffiths, and, and I certainly hope that he's had the benefit of hearing that that uh, that panel. But my question, I suppose, in relation to that is, what is the one thing either of you would do differently now? If you could do something differently, what's the one thing that you'd have learnt over the past time, or what's the one thing you would love to be able to do differently? You wouldn't have taken the health portfolio. Eleventh <laughs> of January, <laughs> <the> agriculture. <laughs> 
I, I, I don't know if I, I, could, I could pick um, one thing, Chair, to, to, to be to be honest with you, to, to deal with the whole thing in hindsight. There's a number of avenues that that we would look at differently. Um, I, I couldn't pick one thing off the off, off the top of my head, Chair, to be, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, I mean, and I, I I would be the same. I I, I think it's impossible to pick one thing. I mean, in relation to independent SAGE, just to assure you, um, we take scientific evidence from SAGE, but we also look very carefully at the reports of independent SAGE, and we look at international practice, and we look at publications and papers from elsewhere. We're not relying, in terms of um, scientific advice towards policy, just from the outputs of, of SAGE. Yeah, and, and I think, and, and that's welcome, and I think we all should do that. And I think science works best when it is is open to challenge. It's open to to other other a, a range of a range of information. But just for clarity, I don't think independent sage even existed at the time when, when that that was that was a group of people who had experience relevant to to what we are all dealing with. So, um, okay, listen, I would like to thank you both for your time here today. I do note that the, uh, the that all of the easement measures within your own within your own document reference the fact that this all depends upon good social distancing. On behalf of the committee, and I know on behalf of yourselves, we would again want to reiterate to the public: please abide by that social distancing. Please work from home if you can. We are not out of the woods in terms of this yet, and, and the easements depend on us adhering to the guidance that's coming from yourselves. We'll just ask people to continue with that. No, uh, look, and I appreciate that message, uh, Chair, and I appreciate the support of the committee as well. So it's, it is about asking people just to take, take these small steps uh, with us at this moment in time. Um, because I think Northern Ireland, we're, we're, not, we're not in the place we could have been. I think that's down, thankfully, to our health service, but it's also down to the people in Northern Ireland working with us as well. So thank you very much again. I think 23rd of June, I think we're pencilled in for again, Chair. I think that's correct, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll see you soon. So we'll, we'll see you again. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Professor Ian Young. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. OK, members. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, I'm moving on then to any other business. Do members have any other business? No other business. The time and place of the next meeting. The next meeting is tomorrow at 10.30, so it will not be long until we all shall meet again. But could I ask, maybe, could we get a quick 15 minutes at the start of that, just to discuss a number of uh, how we're going to work on, on things on, on the way forward? Could, could we try and be here for 10.15 tomorrow? Or, Leah, are you OK with that? So. So tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to be in room 30, members, and due to social distancing requirements, we can't accommodate everyone in that room. And I'd appreciate if some members would offer to maybe dial in tomorrow. I would dial in. You dial in? And Arlea? I'll dial in. Yeah, OK. OK, I appreciate that, members. So we, we'll meet again tomorrow morning, and uh, I'll thank you for your attendance today. And that's our meeting brought to a close. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.